you have your Bibles, if you'll open them up with me to um, Matthew chapter 22. Uh, this morning I'm beginning a, a new series today that will run throughout the month of July uh, on focusing on love. I've entitled this series, Living by Love. Living by Love. Uh, this morning's message, uh, I've just entitled The Command to Love. The Command to Love. Um, I believe the greatest expression, demonstration we have of God's love for mankind is simply the giving of His Son, Jesus. Uh, many of uh, you uh, see the communion plates just as a little heads up. We'll have communion at the end of service this morning. We recognize communion the first Sunday of every month here at Cornerstone. But I felt like uh, it would fit well at the conclusion of this morning's message versus at the end of, of worship. But once again, that tremendous demonstration, you can quote it, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. We talked about that uh, a little bit last Sunday, a, a beautiful, what I would often classify as a supreme expression, demonstration of God's love. As we look into the teachings of Jesus, spent time reflecting on them, I believe foremost in the teachings of Christ is His encouragement and that we respond to one another in love. And, and that's what we're really going to begin to focus on over these next several weeks. The Jewish religious leaders had gone to great lengths in their attempts to detail the requirements of God. In fact, these are just approximate numbers, but they had developed 248 affirmative precepts. Along with that, they had developed 365 negative precepts that one must keep to be in proper relationship with God and also in proper relationship with others. I don't know about you, but that seems like quite a bit. How, how well could we remember all 248 of the positive precepts and 365 of the negative precepts? But thank goodness for the teachings of Christ. Because as we look into it, He condensed all of that down to just one word. What was that word? Love. Love. Look at it with me. Matthew chapter 22. I just want to pick up in the 34th verse. Just reading a little bit of this. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Here's Jesus' summary. Verse 36, teacher, they asked, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment, and the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. For all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Once again, we could summarize this with just one word. What was Jesus' response but simply this, love. Love. Love God, love yourself, and love others. What, what is that? To love God with one's whole being means that we are to relate ourselves totally to God for His glory. To totally relate ourselves to God for God's glory, not ours. To love our neighbor as ourselves means that we do all we can to promote our neighbor's well-being. Encouraging, helping, serving, strengthening those who are our neighbors. And we're going to classify who our neighbors actually are. 
The first and the greatest commandment says, once again, that we are to love God supremely. This is not a totalitarian demand of a tyrannical God, but this command can be, dis can be discovered uh, through God's grace as He seeks to help us with the various priorities of our life. We are to love God, think of this, we are to love God supremely rather than our home. We are to love God supremely rather than our, our work, our place of employment, our business. We are to love God supremely above anything and all other things, simply to love God. They asked Jesus, which is the greatest commandment? And once again, his response is, just paraphrasing, to love God with everything inside of you before anything else in our life. And then we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. We wonder how often does this happen? How well is this being done? And I believe there's great litmus test in this for us and really just self-examining not others around us, which we easily do, but also self-examining ourselves. Why do we struggle to love our neighbors? Why does the world love, struggle to love their neighbors? Think of this for just a moment in Revelation to, to God's Word. I believe it has to be because we don't rightfully love ourselves. Think of the second commandment, to love others as you love yourself. So if I'm not properly loving myself, and this is not talking about being selfish. We're going to expound on this once again in just a moment. But if I, if I don't properly love myself the way that God has purposed me to love myself, then there's always going to be that struggle to love those around me, to love my neighbors. Loving oneself, some would say, is at an all-time deficiency in mankind. The way we seek to destroy ourselves is higher than it ever has been before. And we wonder why people can't love others. But all of this is derived from a proper love with God and rightfully walking with God. So we look at these commands of Jesus and the question comes, can love actually be commanded? Can it be commanded? Because there's many that says that love cannot be commanded. But in trying to answer the question this morning, we first must identify what kind of love is Christ talking about right here? What, what kind of love specifically? We, we, we talked about this briefly as we went through our series with families. There are, uh, in the Greek terminology, there are uh, four different types of love, three different types which are alluded to uh, distinctly here in, in the New Testament. Let me, let me give these to you real quickly. This is my first point for you, the three kinds of love that we find in the New Testament. Number one, and I'm just going to skim through these, that most people are most familiar or recognize more often than not is what we classify as that eros love. That, that's what is referred to as that sexual type of love, that sensual type of love. It's that type of love that is really the most selfish type of love, that eros type of love. Our, our sexuality is designed to be a, a godly part of our life, but oftentimes it becomes very distorted by the acts and the demonstrations uh, of the world. With an appreciation for the goodness of this gift to the human family, we need to recognize that Jesus... Jesus was commending something other than this particular type of love here in Matthew chapter 22. The second type of love that we, we find in the New Testament is what is referred to as that phileo, that philia. 
type of love. That's a friendship love. It's a love that's often based off worth and loveliness of one kind. It's a good love. It's a valuable kind of, of love. Once again, however, this is not the love that Jesus is referring to here in Matthew, the 22nd chapter. So the third that we find in the New Testament is an agape love. An agape love. That's the love that's spoken of in John 3.16 also. For God so loved. That's an, an agape love that we discover in John 3.16. What, what is agape love? Because this is what, what, what Christ is referring to. This, this is a, a, a godly love. It's a sacrificial. It's a, a self-denying. It, it's summed up in what I often refer to as a Calvary kind of love. Or it's not about me, but it's for somebody else. It's honoring somebody else. It's elevating somebody else. And it's this love, an agape love, that can be commanded and directed by the minds and the will of a person who chooses to love. So the question, can love be commanded? The, the love Jesus commanded us to practice toward others, and particularly those within the family circle, as we've identified over our last series, is this agape type of love. It's a, it's a choice that I make. Once again, as I, I said, it's a, a sacrificial, it's a self-denying love. I, I, I'm not longing, I'm not desiring to elevate myself, but I, I'm giving of myself for the betterment of somebody else around me, a wife, a child, a friend, a neighbor, who knows who that may be. That, that's a choice, once again, that you and I make. It, it's not a choice based off how I feel. It's not a, a choice based off my worth or somebody else's worth. It's, it, it's not a a, a, a sensual type of feeling that comes and goes, but it's just a choice that I make that I've determined that I'm going to love that individual no matter what, good or bad. I'm going to love that individual. So secondly, and somebody say, hey, man, I've only got two points for you today. Somebody told me last week, that was the shortest message I've ever heard you give. Well, this one's not going to be as short, but who knows? We'll see where it goes. Number two, the scope. What is the scope of the commandments of love? Look back to it, Matthew 22. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Number one, verse 37, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment, and the second is like like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. So what is our scope? First of all, we must first and foremost have a proper love of God. A proper love of God. Only, only when I, you, we dedicate ourselves to God and give ourselves completely to His glory can we have the capacity to rightfully love God and along with that, the capacity to love ourselves and to love others? But it begins with a proper love for God. You've heard me say this. The greatest thing I pray for the church is, Lord, that we walk in your love. God, that we rightfully love you. God, and that we rightfully walk in your love, receiving your love in, into our life. Because without it, you'll walk in a lot of hurt. You'll walk in a lot of pain. You'll walk in a lot of misery of life. But it's only when I have a proper love of God does everything else in relationship to love, because it flows from that relationship, properly work within our life. So Jesus says, simply love God with all your heart. Love God with all your soul. Love God with everything inside of you. 
Secondly, we must have a proper love for ourselves. Jesus said, you, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. To, to, to love we, to, 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 the, the love we have for ourselves is measured, catch this, is measured by how we love those around us. Think of that for just a moment. The love you have for yourself is measured by how you love others around you. How well, how well do I love those close to me? How well do I love those who I'm in association with? Think of this, if for some reason we hate ourselves, then we're probably going to hate those around us. But if I love myself, I'm going to love those who are around me. So it begins, once again, by having a proper love of God and through a love with God, having a proper love for who I am, for what God created me uh, to be. So it begs the question, do you really love yourself? Or the flip side of that, do I dislike myself? Do you find yourself constantly cutting yourself down? Are you guilty? Think of this one. Are you guilty of punishing yourself for past failures or bad decisions which have long been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ? It's demonstrating how I love myself. Do you dislike that reflection in the mirror that you see and wish that it was someone or something different. If so, not only are you depriving yourself of love, but naturally you're depriving others of love. Think of this for just a moment. Just a simple dialogue. Who do we believe our Creator is? We've talked about this in the past. God. God took the time to form you, to mold you, to fashion you, to create you in who you are. Now, I realize that there are many things that work against that creation, namely, and probably more often than not, ourselves. But we have to become content with who God created, who God molded us, purposed for each one of us to become. You've often heard it said, thank, thank goodness that, that none of us are alike. So, some are close if you walked in, and obviously you did today. It seems like God created two identical black dogs out there. I don't know where they came from. They just showed up this morning, just so you know. Some of y'all probably had that question. They, they look like maybe they're twins, but I, I would imagine if you got down and really studied them, there, there's some difference. But we can look around the room and see obvious differences between each one of us that are in this room. There's uniqueness about each one of us. That's God's mark in your life. I shared this years ago. My, my mom used to be a, a teacher assistant after years of an in-home daycare. And, and she was an assistant in a classroom with... Um, I don't know the proper term for them, but we'll just call them disabled young kids. Crippled physically, crippled mentally, who knows? But the world puts an identification with them. And, and they were having a, a self-help seminar at our high school where my mom worked. And my mom worked with these, these groups of people for, for years. And, and a few of them she worked with for 10 to 15 years. And, and, and there was this one beautiful young lady that they, they called her up on a scale of, of rating themselves. How, how, how do they see themselves? One not being very good and, and 10 being perfect. Think of this. This is a self-help seminar for teenage students. 
and they call this young lady up and they, they said, on a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate yourself? Her response is, I, I think I'm a 12. They said, no, I don't think you understood. <laughs> the highest is a 10. Now, it's a self-help seminar. She's seeing herself somewhere, and they're already trying to diminish how, they see, how she sees herself. Kind of interesting. I think if I was the principal, I might have just thrown the guy out, the people out right then. They said, but one being bad, ten being the highest. She goes, just as confidently as could be, I've got to be at least a 12. They said, no, you can't. She goes, well, the Bible says that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made by God. So if the highest man could give me is a 10, I've got to at least be a little bit higher than that. And the whole audience began to do exactly what you did. And the seminar people were just stunned. She understood who she was. She had developed a proper view of who she was in the eyes of God. It would help us to develop a proper view of who we are. For we are the handiwork of God, the creation of God. He loved us so much that He took time to form us, to, to make us. I, I have to become, just as she did, I have to become content with who that person is in the mirror. The way God physically made me and allowing the, 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 the character that God has first created me to be to continue to flourish and to continue to mature and to continue to grow in my life. And, and that only happens when I walk in right relationship with God, walking in that, that love with God and, and understanding the, the proper love of myself. And that's demonstrated in how I love those who are around me. So once again, perhaps... Our greatest need is to accept ourselves as God's creation and the object of His loving concern. Accept His grace. Accept His forgiveness. They talked about this in class a little bit this morning. And then I've got to learn to forgive myself of my past, my failures, my mistakes. But I only can do that when I began to grow in revelation of God's love and God's forgiveness and God's grace and then begin to demonstrate some of that agape love toward myself, to begin to demonstrate some of that agape love toward others, allowing the Holy Spirit to enlarge our capacity of love for those around us. Thirdly, we're commanded to love our neighbor. It's always interesting, the question, for whatever reason, comes, well, who's my neighbor? I think the question alone depicts how little we want to love. Who's my neighbor? Well, Jesus helps us. He answers that question. In Luke chapter 10, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read it. It's a great parable of a man who's wounded. And a priest comes by, the Bible says, and he pass along on the other side of the road. Then a Levite comes by and he passes along on the other side of the road. And then a Samaritan comes, the one who naturally should pass by on the other side of the road because there's not that connection between the Jew and the Samaritan. But the Samaritan comes by and begins to love an agape love and be, begins to care and to, to help the wounded that's there, providing a shelter for the wounded that is there. Jesus would have us believe that, catch this, any person, any person in need of ministry or service is your neighbor. Can I say it one more time? Any person in need of your help, your service, is your neighbor. It's illustrated in this story that we often refer to as 
the Good Samaritan. If I see somebody in need, that's my neighbor. They don't have to live next door to me. It can be anywhere. I could be shopping at Walmart and a mom with two kids and a basket full of groceries. She's my neighbor at that moment. Why? Because she probably needs help. Somebody to open the door for her. Somebody to close the door for her. Maybe somebody to help her get the groceries into her car. Who knows what the need is that you're in. But at that moment, that individual is now my neighbor. Why? Because there's that opportunity. There's a need that's represented in a chance to, to serve. Fourthly, in the scope of, of love, John 13 helps to answer the question, can, can love be commended? Will we find Jesus give the commitment? But in John 13, verses 34, Jesus makes the this statement, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, he declares, all will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. We're called to love one another first because each one of us is an object of the divine love of God. We've experienced the love of Jesus Christ and we're to love others that we might continuously be able to demonstrate God's love, His agape love, to those that we come in contact with. Without it, the Bible says, then we're really nothing. Catch it, 1 Corinthians. If I speak in tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries of all knowledge, and I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, it concludes that I am nothing. Love. Love. To love those that we come in contact with. To love those that we live with. Can we be commanded? Sure we are. We find the commandment of Jesus over and over and over. And I'll conclude with the last two within the scope of, our, uh, 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 of love. Uh, the, the first three or four probably aren't that difficult. Loving God. As we learn to love God, loving ourselves. As we grow in loving ourselves, effectively loving others. Can we walk in the command of love? Sure we can as we walk in a relationship with God. But when we get into this next one, this is when a challenge really begins to arise. So let me give it to you. We are commanded to love our enemies. To love our enemies. Let's get back to Matthew chapter 5. I want to give it to you real quick. Matthew 5. Pick up with me in verse 43. You have heard that it was said, love your, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, and these are the words of Jesus, verse 44, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Why? Verse 45, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, sons and daughters of God in heaven in heaven. So I realized it's sometimes a big challenge to love ourselves and the test is how we love others. But I want to give you even a greater test and how you love your enemies. This is always a difficult passage. The nature of Jesus commanding us to love those who hate us, to love those who despise us, to love those who reject us. I, I understand it's not instinctual. It's not common. But God is not calling us and commanding us to a, a common love. I believe that God is calling and commanding us to a, an uncommon love, a supreme love. That, that, that's what this agape love is, is. Once again, it's that Calvary kind of love with which we are to retaliate to those who mistreat us with love. Think, think about this on Calvary. Uh, Jesus has, has been whipped. He's being tortured. He's had a crown of thorns placed on his head. He's being mocked. He's being 
spit upon. They're hurling insults at him. It get, getting close to the point that they're fixing to stick a spear into his side. And, and what does Jesus say? God, Dad, can you get them back? Because they know exactly what it is that they're doing. No. No. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. That's an agape love. How often? Another test of love, when things don't go right in our life, oh, they just don't like me. They have it out for me. They're just trying to make life miserable for me. They're personally wanting to attack me. You throw in, because you've heard them all. But Jesus says, love those. Pray for those. Don't just love those who love you, because anybody can do that. But love those who hate you. Love those who despise you. Love those who spit on you. And, and, and let's be honest, Jesus can say that. Why? Because he demonstrated it. Over and over and over again. We, we often just think to Calvary, but many times over, Jesus demonstrates this love when they're, they're trying to kill him, when they're, they're trying to trap him, when they're, they're speaking evil against Jesus. What does Jesus do? Over and over and over again, he just loves those people. He, he saves them. He heals them. He restores their family. He casts out demons from these that are broken of life. He loves them. And he prays for them. Think of this. God's love does not discriminate, but pours itself out on friends and enemies alike. God's love is not motivated. Agape love is not motivated by human merit or loveliness. It just gives. It just gives. God's love is governed by God's own character, which is what? It's ever self-giving and ever self-denying. God's love seeks the best for friends and foes alike. It doesn't matter. Being willing to love those who hate us, despise us, abuse us, those who mistreat us, and I'm going to hit this last one as I begin to conclude this morning and the worship team comes back. May we be reminded once again, we're called to love our wife, to love our husband. A husband is called to love his wife as Christ loves the church, sacrificial, self-giving. A wife is called to love her husband. To honor her husband. It's interesting once again, as a quick reflection back to Ephesians 5, that's not an eros type of love. That's still an agape type of love. A self-giving, self-denying type of love. Even within the family. It's a choice that we make to love one another. And I summarize it all with this, according to 1 John, God is love. God is love. God has loved each of us in his life. God has loved us in his death. God has loved us in the resurrection and through his son, Jesus Christ. I'll say it again. He continues to love us in the here and now. And God continues to love us through all eternity. When we walk in his love. So I just encourage you, respond sincerely. Respond steadfastly by faith. Respond positively to the, the love that we find in Jesus Christ. The love that Jesus has taught us about. Live, live a life of faithfulness that expresses itself in, in walking daily in the love of Jesus Christ. Just as he first loved us, laid down his life. And gave his love for each one of us. 
And I want to conclude this morning's message with a, what we refer to often as a, a moment of remembrance.